Hi, I'm Mike Olson, senior analyst at The Motley Fool. We're here at the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, and we're here at the Value Investing Conference, where we have a gathering of great value investors. And so we decided we'd take an opportunity to speak with some investors we like. I'm here with Bob Rabati of Rabati & Company. He is the founding partner, and uh, we're big fans of his work here. So pleased to have the opportunity to speak with us. For those people who don't know a lot about your work, Bob, can you just tell us a little bit about your process, style, how you guys approach value investing? Uh, sure. Um, um, you know, we think an important part of uh, being a successful investor is to have a long-term contrarian point of view, but important in being successful uh, in that you really have to have the right temperament because frequently the market's going <clears> to <throat> disagree with you on the conclusions that you're coming to because that's what you're doing, developing a contrarian viewpoint. And so, you know, the daily indicators are going to disagree with you. So the commitment to stay with that, to continue to develop that investment thesis over time, uh, and to continue to gather information that uh, confirms, of course, a contrarian point of view by itself doesn't mean it's a winning point of view, right? The thesis has to be right also. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, the time, the spend, uh, the work associated with it continues to build uh, your um, conviction that you've got it right, and therefore the market's going to provide you opportunities in the meantime then when it disagrees with you and potentially brings the stock price down and therefore enable you to invest even later on when you know more and even have a higher conviction level at lower prices. Mm -hmm. I think a great example of uh, what a representative example rather of where you guys have kind of looked for this intersection of stress, cyclicality and what is a fundamentally solid business, great tailwinds, is the investment you guys made in Builders First Source a few years ago. You want to tell people about that and kind of what the thinking was because I think that's really a great example of what you guys do. Sure. Um, <clears throat> it's, a, of course, a relatively straightforward idea. You know, it was uh, May 09, we, uh, you know, visited the company. Uh, we had visited a number of times, uh, and one of the guys in the office uh, had visited with him, you know, over the decades. And uh, so <clears throat> it was predicated on the idea that we were only building 500,000 homes in America. Right. And yet, on a sustainable basis, uh, population, demographics, you're going to need to build at least a million homes in America. Right. And, uh, you know, the industry was clearly going through a bad time in a corrective process. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought that Builders First Source was one of the companies that would be able to survive through that process. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, you know, in an environment of a million home uh, production, you know, we thought the earnings potential of business was dramatically higher than the indicated price of the company was at the time. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you know, it uh, made sense. And we continue to kind of invest in the industry and spend a lot of time and think about it and continue to develop that thesis. Because mm -hmm. today we still own most of the stock we bought. And, you know, a typical value investor looking at the numbers today on a trailing basis, uh, you know, it's not the kind of stock that is a value stock. It doesn't have tangible assets. Mm -hmm. You know, the historical numbers in recent years, of course, doesn't justify the current price of the stock. But yet uh, the conviction we've uh, developed in looking at the business and trying to get the dynamics of what's happening in the end industry, uh, you know, bolstered the fact that we think it's still an, an interesting company today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of skipping forward and looking at today, this environment, um, I mean, by many standards, this is not a particularly attractive um, market for value investors. Can you talk about a few ideas? I know you guys are energy-focused investors, which is one of the few bastions of uh, remaining value within this market. Do you want to talk about some ideas that you like right now? Sure. Um, <clears throat> we do think that energy is interesting. Of course, energy, uh, it's also, you know, what is energy? It's uh, sure. you know, <clears throat> oil and gas, uh, and then, of course, gas is very much a localized market, so therefore you get big disconnection. So oil price itself, of course, for a long time has been at reasonably high levels. Uh, you know, I'd hardly say that $90, $100 a barrel is any discounted price. No. That said, natural gas is significantly underpriced uh, in terms of its energy source in North America because it really, there's uh, the production base here and the ability to export it is really not uh, available. So therefore, you get a huge price disparity. And of course, even today, gas prices moved up dramatically in the last year mm -hmm. from, you know, mid twos to somewhere in the mid fours. Mm -hmm. But even in the mid fours, you know, a six times multiple is the energy equivalency, you know, you get $30 oil price. So you can buy the same amount of energy uh, hydrocarbons and power generation and a barrel of oil at 90, or you can get it in natural gas equivalent of 30. And we think that's a really important driver because we think that huge price disparity doesn't go away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not only is it important to the energy business, we think it's also important generally to America. And we're, you know, really positive, we think, on the next 10-year outlook for America because we think that energy efficiency is going to creep into all of industrial America. And, you know, we envision, a, and it, you know, and uh, many other people have said, the idea that, you know, there really is an industrial resurgence in America. You've got a fundamental piece that uh, is going to help drive that being a reality, we think. Right. Yeah. I mean, and I think, actually, I might ask you an unfair question. You can just tell me to pound sand if you don't want to answer it. But 
by many accounts, and I think you know, there are kind of two sides to this argument. There's one that there is going to be a sustainably cheap source of natural gas in, in the North America for, you know, on a 20 or 30 year basis. And then there's the other camp, and this has been really, um, they've really pounded on this, the dry gas producers saying that it's uneconomic to produce natural gas at these prices. So if you had to you know, put your, your flag down, what do you think a fair value for natural gas is right now? Well, first off, the, those two camps, I say, th those are consistent ideas. At today's mm -hmm. prices, the production of natural gas is not an economic activity. The fact that that natural gas exists and is here, you know, that, that is an important component. So that's what's going to give you the long-term mm -hmm. opportunity to have that price disparity. Um, what was the question you asked me again? I guess, what do you think, what do you think an economic price is? Oh, yeah, what do you okay. think a long-term fair value for natural gas is? Uh, well, well um, over time, uh, you, you know, everybody, uh, there is a huge number of people who are thinking about that arbitrage because, mm -hmm. you know, the dollars associated with the arbitrage between oil and natural gas today in North America right. is tremendous. And over time, uh, economics 101, capitalist system is really going to eliminate that disparity. Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to take a long time to happen. You know, mm -hmm. clearly the largest use of oil in America, uh, oil anywhere in the world, is really for a transportation source. And so, mm -hmm. you know, today that's really not an alternative. But, mm -hmm. you know, in 20 years' time, for sure, you know, we're going to have plenty of capability to, to move vehicles around and use natural gas somehow to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it's, you know, I don't know what that timeline is, but it's definitely not going to be in five years' time. So mm -hmm. it's somewhere yeah. in between in that process. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I think long term, the price of natural gas and the price of oil, and one could even argue the price of natural gas should be on a BTU basis cheaper than, uh, I mean, higher than oil because, right. you know, there is less pollution associated with it. So it, it doesn't have as many detrimental effects as the consumption of oil does. Right. So there clearly are benefits. And mm -hmm. over time, you know, the economic system will eliminate that disparity in price. Uh, but that's not happening anytime soon. Mm -hmm. In the short term or in the intermediate term, in the next three to five years, you know, I think that there's reasonable uh, the credibility to the concept that natural gas is bound range, uh, range bound mm -hmm. because <clears throat> uh, you know, already higher prices starting to back into coal, right? Mm -hmm. So utilities are now starting, you know, have the capability economically to go back to burning coal again. So that mm -hmm. will act as a regulator on gas prices. At the same time, there are plenty of fields that people have identified where they can drill natural gas. And those different fields probably have very different marginal costs to make economic returns. Right. So the Haynesville today is one where probably activity is already, not the Haynesville, it, uh, the Fayetteville is one in which activity is already probably picked up and it probably is economic and therefore mm -hmm. you'll see more activity. And so in these different locations, as you do start to get more activity, that will act once again as a regulator on where price goes. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to get four, 450 $5. I don't think it's going higher than that and mm -hmm. sometime in the next three, four years. Right, right. I, th I, think that's a, I think that's probably a fair view. And I guess in light of that, um, well, there are two questions. I, I'll ask you one first. When you think about companies if, where, suppose price were a non-issue, and I know you guys are value investors, and so this, we are value investors, so that's not necessarily a fair question, but if price were a non-issue, what are a few companies that you think are you know, really sustainably well-positioned companies in terms of their, their competitive position and also the, the quality of capital allocation on behalf of the managers? Let's say maybe one integrated oil and gas company, an independent, a services name, and maybe maybe one that I just you know is kind of an oddball that I haven't pegged in that in that sphere. Um, you know, most of what we do in energy really is focused on the service end of the business and mm -hmm. really not on the producers mm -hmm. because the producers really are uh, significantly impacted directly by price and price is the most mm -hmm. important mm -hmm. determinant of what do they sell that commodity for, what the margin is, what the return is, and what mm -hmm. the value of the reserves they have in the ground are. And so because of that, we have less conviction and definitely on natural gas in North America, as I said, for the next three to five years in mm -hmm. terms of where the price goes. So what we do think actually is the activity level is probably going to be pretty sustainable and will continue to be high. So therefore, we're, we prefer kind of the guys who are the picks and shovels because mm -hmm. we do think actually, uh, you know, for the, the scenario we've got in mind, you know, that's a better place to be with more sure. predictability and higher conviction. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, one of the companies specifically we've talked about a number of times is Calfrac. Mm -hmm. It's a Canadian company. Uh, and we think it has a lot of uh, significant advantages to it, and the prices uh, we think very discounted today. And uh, the sustainable, we think recurring earnings level is uh, very much higher than uh, you know what would indicate the prices today. Mm -hmm. So we think that's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it also has a lot of uh, specific dynamics because everything we do is bottom-up stock picking. So therefore, uh, you know, there's differentiation even within an industry. So Calfrac and Trican are two Canadian uh, natural gas pressure pumping businesses, mm -hmm. and uh, and because of that. Uh, you know, they really originally come out of Canada and have a very good competitive position in that market.
marketplace. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is relationship, uh, the people and the producers who are going to use them in that market know them. And so the two of them close have close to 50% market share, mm -hmm. uh, where the big three in that business are Halliburton, Schlumberger, and uh, Baker Hughes, mm -hmm. you know, really are uh, much more uh, you know, peripheral players in that marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, we also think that that's really an important component too because the activity level in Canada we see picking up more than we can generally across the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are two drivers on that. And, um, one of them is oil, right? So the application of horizontal drilling to Canada has actually come later uh, than what it has come to places uh, like the Bakken. Mm -hmm. uh, although the part of the Bakken clearly goes into Canada too. Right. So as more and more uh, fields are located and identified that are candidates for horizontal drilling, we think there's a pickup, a significant pickup in the oil drilling activity. Mm -hmm. What we also think is that LNG, you know, is one of the uh, things out there that will help um, equalize the price of natural gas and oil. Mm -hmm. However, there's a long timeline on those projects, sure. especially in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, but in Canada, we think those projects are actually much further along, make a lot more sense. They have proximity to Asia. You have a lot of the investors in LNG plants are Asian uh, energy companies. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, uh, earlier this week, um, um, uh, you know, Petronas on their project signed the first contract they have to actually export LNG. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we think that happens sooner rather than later, and because of that, that means the activity level in the drilling has to precede the opening of the plant by a significant amount of time. Mm -hmm. So we think even natural gas drilling in Canada has the potential to particularly to pick up significantly faster than in the U.S. We also think that longer term, that's really an important driver too, because the Canadian market produces 15 billion cubic feet of natural gas a day, yeah. and those LNG plants can do between one to two B BCF of uh, exports per day. So if you put in two LNG plants uh, and you figure that out a number of years from now, you're suddenly talking about three, four BCF a day, you might be able to export on a production base of 15, that really mm -hmm. moves the meter. If you have two, three LNG plants in the United States that can that export, you know, four to five BCF a day, and we can produce 70 BCF a day, it's, it's a much smaller impact, and you're really not going to get price movements. We mm -hmm. think in Canada you do. And so therefore, that's going to ramp up even natural gas drilling activity. So therefore, you know, that uh, competitive uh, position in Canada is an important driver and the company. In addition, Canadian companies tend to be, right, they look for places to expand and they think about the United States, but that's a very competitive market, right? It's the much, the largest oil service uh, market in the world. Right. And instead, they tend to go other places, including the Canadian independents go other places. Mm -hmm. So they go to Colombia, they go to Argentina, they go to Russia. Right. And uh, uh, CalFrac has been in a lot of those markets in, in certain cases for Russia for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. And those markets are you know, continuing to apply the horizontal drilling and uh, hydraulic fracking technology to them. So therefore, we think there's really good growth in the international market because clearly that technology is not one that's going to be limited to just North America. Right. It has applications elsewhere. So those markets we think are great, interesting growth markets where the company has a foot first mover advantage. So those are really positive things. And then even in the United States where they entered in in 2009 because the energy business is cyclical. There's right. no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that uh, allows a disciplined long-term investor the opportunity to buy in at the uh, weak points in the cycle. And of course, if you buy into the right company with the right management, with the right thought process and the right allocation of capital that realizes that too, mm -hmm. you know, then they allocate capital at the right times and they don't do it on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And so that's what uh, CalFrac did in uh, 2009. They acquired two U.S. companies at less than replacement value, so therefore entered into the market at a very attractive price where they couldn't replicate that, uh, you know, on a direct basis. Mm -hmm. And so, once again, we think there's probably opportunities for consolidation in the U.S., and we think that's interesting. We also think longer term we're confused about the pressure pumping business because in the United States, the three large players are the big three. It's Halliburton, Schlumberger, and Baker Hughes. Right. And <clears throat> uh, of course, those companies, a number of them used to be in the onshore drilling business and are not in that business today because right. it's much too commodity oriented and it's asset intensive. So the same thing is true now of pressure pumping. So I don't know what they're going to do with that business. They didn't invest and lost share significantly over the last number of years. You know, they, I don't think they really want to invest in that business today, reinvest mm -hmm. in it. So I don't know what happens, but I think that's an interesting driver. The last thing we like about it is the management owns 25% uh, of the company, the management and the board, and so therefore it's uh, they have skin in the game. They think about capital allocation, they understand that process, and therefore that gives us a much higher conviction rate mm -hmm. that when they employ capital, it's really going to be intelligently employed that really builds. Uh, and, and the earnings concept of the business is also straightforward too. In 2011, the company earned over $4 a share. At the time, they had 600,000 horsepower capacity. Today, they have a million horsepower capacity, so it's 40% larger capacity than they did in 2011. At some point, we think pricing gets strong again. It may not get to the level
level, but therefore we think the earnings power of the business is definitely higher than what it was, mm -hmm. and we'll continue, because this business will continue to grow because the application of the technology makes all the sense in the world. So therefore you got a, a business that's a growth business that is cyclical, that has a higher capacity today, and has a depressed earnings level, and we think those earnings, uh, you know, therefore at today's $25 price, you know, uh, you've got a company we think can earn $5 a share mm -hmm. on a sustainable basis. So, you know, very uh, low number in terms of sustainable earnings level. Right. right, and I think it's very interesting to note that you really have some great sort of secular tailwinds at their back in terms of the, the increased complexity of drilling, more frack stages, and I mean, for those who are not intimately familiar with what fracking or pressure pumping is, basically it's when drillers will go ahead and push some combination of water, sand, and some special sauce through rock in order to release natural <laughs> gas and or oil in pressurized formations. Um, and of course, this is a critical or very significant new technology, which is, has proven instrumental in releasing the potential of shales. Uh, that hasn't so much found its way to Canada thus far. And you also have a relatively, as Bob has noted, consolidated industry dynamic. Players have been very disciplined right there. And so that's what I think you know, makes this relatively interesting. Um, Kind of zooming out, and I guess you, it was interesting you're noting capital allocation, valuation, cyclical businesses. Um, I think there are a lot of investors, you guys were, were quite calm and, and sort of sanguine in terms of just putting money to work during the credit crisis and not really thinking twice about it. Um, a lot of other investors said, you know, we've learned, we learned some very difficult lessons during that period. Do, would you say there were, there were any tweaks to your process that you would have made if you could go ahead and look back? And are there any, you know, high-level learnings from that? Uh, <clears throat> you know, in, in the period leading up to that, um, uh, <clears throat> when we got a new individual account in like 06, 07, mm -hmm. we would tell people, oh, gee, it's going to, you know, we, <clears throat> we're going to only invest the capital when we see things to buy, the price makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to take us some period of time to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was what we were actually experiencing. It was taking longer and longer to get the capital invested. Mm -hmm. So there was a clear indicator to us that, you know, the valuation, price to value kind of numbers were right. not nearly as attractive as what we mm -hmm. thought they were. Mm -hmm. so, so to maybe have taken more cues from that and then therefore to have been more cautious is something that, you know, we'd like to think that we'll learn from that in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but other than that, you know, I don't think we, you know, uh, tremendously changed our process pre and post the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. Are there, are there any, I know some investors there are just industries or, or varieties of investments that are strictly off limits and that, you know, they are in the too hard or do not know pile. Is there, is there any particular investment where, or breed of investment that you guys will not go near for some particular reason? Or is it just strictly a function of price and, you know, what you can get in at? <clears throat> I, I would think conceptually there's not necessarily an area that we, you know, wouldn't invest in. Mm -hmm. uh, there are plenty of things we look at and, you know, when we uh, begin to look at them, you know, we don't have anywhere near the conviction and understanding of the business and the dr important drivers in the business mm -hmm. and therefore we haven't invested in them. Um, <clears throat> you know, our involvement with home building, I guess we've historically had some involvement through the manufactured housing industry pre our investment right. in, in uh, Builders First Source, but you know that was a newer industry for us, mm -hmm. uh, and you know we waded in because we thought uh, you know became easy enough to have conviction, even if we had uh, there were enough of drivers in the business we could figure out. Mm -hmm. So I would th think in general, there's not necessarily an industry we, w we wouldn't invest in, but there are plenty that in actuality we've uh, looked at, thought it looks cheap, but didn't have a high enough conviction, so we've moved on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, seeing as we are at Berkshire and we're in Omaha, any discussion would of course be remiss without a reference to Warren himself. And so I guess if you were to look at you know the, the collected wisdom and and teachings of Warren Buffett over the course of the years, what would you say that you know Warren has really given, uh, in, or what wisdom has Warren given to investors that you would say should be you know heeded and noted empirically over all time? Wow, that's such a hard thing because there's uh, you know there's so many aspects of investing that uh, you know his experience and his ability to communicate are so succinct and like that is so true. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and of course, many of the ideas, even he, you know, is kind enough to attribute to somebody else who said it before him. Sure. So, uh, you know, a lot There's of no original thesis. A lot of a lot of investing really is. It's kind of like, what do smart people do? How do they work? And how do I replicate that? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, you know, he's got plenty of models that we all clearly want to try to study and understand and try to replicate. Right. Um, right. So, uh, you know, I, I couldn't necessarily point to one thing, but um, mm -hmm. the collective knowledge and his ability to communicate that is, is uh, you know, unparalleled. And clearly mm -hmm. this is one of the reasons why, A, he's so successful, but B, also why this event is so interesting. Right, right. Um, I know you guys are, are 
I believe you have a small position in Berkshire and you have for some time. Um, when you think about Berkshire and you think about the future, um, is there anything that really worries you about the nature of the investment? I mean, right now the shares traded about 1.4 times book, 17 and a half times the earnings of the operating businesses, and you know, depending upon what you believe the investment portfolio can earn, substantially less. Um, what, what worries you about that, or what would you say you, keeps you awake at night? On, you know? <clears throat> I don't think there's a lot that should keep uh, investors in Berkshire awake at night. I think it's, mm -hmm. a, you know, it's a great investment. And given the alternatives in the investment world, it's, you know, uh, it's better than most, right? Because mm -hmm. index investing, probably for most investors, actually is the best thing they could do. Because sure. uh, most active managers do underperform the indices. And that's a really good index, <laughs> you could argue. <laughs> uh, and so you know, the idea of owning an index, as I say, is you know, probably the best investment that most individuals individuals can make. Alternatively, you can buy Berkshire Hathaway, mm -hmm. which instead of buying the index because it happens to be in an index, you have a guy who is thinking about capital allocation and is really knows what he's doing in and allocating right. it appropriately, mm -hmm. and probably pay, charging you less fees than you would pay even in an index fund, right? Because mm -hmm. you know the fee he makes for uh, running Berkshire Hathaway is uh, you know totally a, totally de minimis. <laughs> so yes. so you get a, a great capital allocator. You get a huge diversified portfolio of businesses, mm -hmm. you know, broader diversification than you probably get even in an index fund. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, they're just like great attributes associated. And it's the kind of thing you can sleep at night with because mm -hmm. you know that someone's up all the time thinking about the company, thinking about the capital allocation. So right. you can sleep at night because Warren is, is thinking about it. Exactly. And even, you know, of course, <clears throat> you know, all of us realize that, uh, you know, we all are finite and eventually, you know, we are going to pass from this earth. And that's, of course, going to be true of Buffett, too. Mm -hmm. And people talk about that and what's going to happen. Happen. And you know, I think it's still going to be a you know great company that has the right culture, the right people who think about capital allocation the right way. Will it be the same thing as when Buffett was here? You know, uh, it's definitely going to lose something in the process mm -hmm. uh, because there's going to be somewhat more people involved with it, and you know, an institutionalization of any process probably uh, you know ends up being detrimental, especially when when it was an entrepreneurial one-person guy, he did it so well. So sure. you know, you can't replicate Warren Buffett. You know, that's mm -hmm. true. But I still think the business that he has, the capital generation of those businesses, the intelligent reinvestment of that capital, those are all things that that really are hallmarks, and for a long, long time are going to be here. So I think for most of our foreseeable investable, investable horizons, uh, you know, Berkshire is a great place that you don't really need to worry about what's going to happen to your money and how it's going to be managed. Absolutely agree as a shareholder. Um, one last question, which kind of dovetails with the, the bit on Berkshire, and I think a lot of folks spend time not only thinking about specific investments here, but thinking about process and how the, the, the act of finding good investments. What would you say, <laughs> I mean, are attributes, characteristics, or, or stylistic traits that you have found to be, you know, because we're all in the process of studying great investors, have found to be those characteristics of great investors, whether it's temperament, whether it's a, a, a stylistic tilt, anything like that? Well, as I say, I think the temperament issue is a really important component. Because sure. uh, uh, in order to outperform the market, you have to have a contrarian point of view. Therefore, you have to invest against the crowd. Therefore, you you're, you're buying something that's irrationally priced, and there's no reason to think it's going to be rationally priced anytime soon. It's a lonely uh, place. <laughs> so, so you have to have that conviction and that capability to, uh, you know, stay with something even if you're getting all these indicators that, you know, you're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that temperament's really an important thing. Yeah. I'm Mike Olson. It's Bob Rabati. Just had the opportunity to speak with him about things value investing, Warren Buffett, and energy. Bob, really appreciate the time and. Uh, Again, thanks. Sure, my pleasure. Thank Great. you. Great being here.